Welcome back for a very special Naval History edition of the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Eric Mills, Editor-in-Chief of Naval History Magazine. Today's podcast is sponsored by Booz Allen. Accelerate today's missions with tomorrow's technologies. As the leader in providing AI solutions to the federal government and one of the world's largest cybersecurity providers, Booz Allen advances game-changing capabilities rapidly, ethically, and securely. Learn more at boozallen.com slash defense. Today, this is a special podcast because we are commemorating the 80th anniversary of the most epic undertaking in the annals of amphibious warfare, an operation that unleashed a tidal wave of manpower onto France's shores that marked the beginning of the end for the Third Reich. I speak, of course, of the Normandy invasion. And here to discuss it with us is the Naval History Author of the Year, who also happens to have written a piece on Operation Neptune, the naval component of the Normandy invasion, in the current June issue of Naval History. I encourage you to read it. So here we are glad to welcome back to the podcast, Ed Offley. Ed, good to see you again. Good morning, Eric. Congratulations again on your victory. Uh, last time I saw you was at the Naval History Annual Meeting. Well, I was very, very delighted to be there. I didn't mention it in my remarks because it was askew, but I did not realize that the Naval Institute building, which is an amazing facility, is located just about 50 yards from my great uncle and his son who are buried. The whole family is buried there in the Naval Academy Cemetery. I'm talking wow. about Marine General Ben Fuller and his son, Captain Ted Fuller, who was a hero of the Battle of Bella Wood and received the Navy Cross uh, posthumously for saving the lives of several of his Marines at the cost of his own. So when I feel like I'm in family there, I'm actually speaking quite literally. How about that? That is just amazing. Right out the window here. Well, that's it's very stirring. And uh, Bella Wood, my goodness, um, that's about as uh, brutal as combat ever gets. And um, battle that made the Marine Corps. The devil dogs through the wheat. Yes, indeed. Today, we're talking about another um, operation, of course, Operation Neptune. It's hard to believe it's been 80 years, but here we are. Um, your article is a very great summation of what goes on there. So why don't you set this table for us? This is the, the, the name of the article is the invasion fleet that liberated Europe. So let's talk about some of the scale and scope of that fleet, because it really was quite an amazing thing. Well, if you look at the raw numbers alone, I, I, you know, I've been reading naval history for a long time, and every time I go back and look at just the, the, the quantity and the and the different kinds of ships and landing craft, it's it's, it's really just amazing that this fleet was built in less than three years. You know, at the time of Pearl Harbor, the Navy only had like, I'd say over five hundred ships, and by the time D Day happened, the Navy had thanks to American shipbuilding and British shipbuilding, both had increased by 10 times the size of the beginning of the war. I mean, that's something you, I don't think you could even contemplate anything on that scale today. It's, it's just truly mind boggling. And the fact that they got it all together in time for what was a very narrow window of opportunity to, to you know, strike the Atlantic Wall, the beaches of Normandy, and successfully land this army of 150,000, I believe was the initial wave. Uh, they had to calculate the moon, the wind, the tides, and 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 a number of other uh, the weather, and it gave them two opportunities in the month of June alone. And the whole time they were trying to safeguard the, the, the real secret of the war, and that is that they were targeting the Norman, Normandy Peninsula and not the narrower uh, passage of the Pas de Calais, where the, the channel is today, where you can go through by train. So all of this is like, was a, I think of it like poor Eisenhower and his subordinates were juggling hand grenades. Uh, and, and the fact is they largely pulled it off. Uh, there was tragedy at Omaha Beach, which we all know. But the fleet got there in, in amazingly good order. And we're talking over 5,000 ships and landing craft in the dead of night with nothing like the navigational 
capabilities that we have today. I, again, I just I shake my head and wonder when 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 I look back on this on this saga. It's easy for us to overlook the the magnitude of the undertaking, and um, I, I've always I'm always impressed not only by the um, sheer size of this operation, but the not only there's inter-service cooperation that's required to a great degree, but there's international cooperation on top of that layer of having to coordinate all these disparate um, groups into one cohesive juggernaut. And I think there's a lot of credit to be given to the American and British leadership that pulled this off. Uh, maybe you can address that a little bit. Well, it's amazing because you, you know you read World War II history, and 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 there were elbows rubbed and egos bruised, uh, literally from the time of North Africa until VE Day. Um, it was a hard time to be a British senior commander. I, I I'm sure because uh, there's a great it's a fictional quote, but it, it really resonated with me uh, at at the Winds of War novel by Herman Wouk when they're at the at the uh, conference in Argentia where Churchill and Roosevelt secretly met to discuss strategies against the, the uh, Axis. Uh, Harry Hopkins turns to Victor Henry and said, you have to remember this is the changing of the guard because the British had carried the torch uh, for most of the war. They had suffered amazing losses at Norway, Greece, and Dunkirk. Uh, they were obviously a much smaller nation uh, than the United States. They had a very good sized fleet, but had been worn down significantly by just years of fighting. So when the alliance, I guess this was at Tehran, when Roosevelt and Stalin and Churchill finally agreed that the invasion of, of Europe over Lord Neptune would happen in June of 44, uh, they sent Eisenhower, Dwight Eisenhower up as the commander in chief, and he very wisely appointed his two immediate subordinates were British. There's uh, Bernard Law Montgomery for the ground forces and Admiral Ramsey for the, for the Navy. And both of them were extremely experienced and qualified in their fields of, of warfare. And then from there, they essentially delegated subgroups by, by nationality. There was a British Admiral in command of the invasion fleet at the three be uh, beaches, Gold Sword and Juno where the Canadians and British landed. And then Admiral Alan uh, Kirk, uh, former uh, chief of naval intelligence and uh, experienced amphibious warfare admiral, uh, was in charge of the force that landed the American three divisions at Utah and Omaha Beach. So it was a really evenly layered partnership of both British and American senior commanders. And there were frictions here and there and later on. But when you read the accounts of Neptune, it went, it went about as smoothly as something this size could go. I think it's a real testament to Ike's organizational skill and um, ability to deal with people and disparate personalities and yet somehow bring them all together. Um, talk about somebody who's uh, tailor-made for a chief executive position. You can see why he won in a landslide running for president in 1952. Not only is he this great war hero, but he's proven this amazing ability to organize and execute on a complexly layered scale. Exactly. But he also said at one point earlier in the war that the best thing for the American effort would be for somebody to shoot Ernie King. But that was earlier. That's a story for another day. Yes. <laughs> and he never said that officially. He said that, like, between friends, I'm imagining. Um but Maybe in his diary, I don't know. He, he, he mumbled it. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so that's the uh, that's on the command level. Now let's talk about like on the actual ship level. Uh, you mentioned this is a fleet of like five thousand, and I should point out to our viewers and listeners that um, there's a, Ed also has an, a, an online exclusive sidebar to this article that goes into a more granular detail about the ships that make up this amazing invasion fleet. Let's talk about the um, some of that, some of the structure of that fleet. Who's involved? Uh, what type of vessels? All that kind of thing. The oldest, all those kind of things. Well, one of the things that it may strike me is a, is a strange writer, but I've become fascinated 
in that people, whether it's a young private who becomes a general over a span of time, and 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 warships, they're they're we're both time travelers, and what you get at Operation Neptune on the shores of Normandy is a fleet that spans naval history from before the Battle of Jutland in 1915 to the to the surge of the Cold War 50 years later item the the one of the oldest ships there was the British battleship War Sprite she saw combat at Jutland against the Imperial German Navy took about eight hits from a German battle cruiser went on got repaired she was involved throughout the early part of World War II in fact she was the flagship for the British when they in, uh, invaded Norway in 1940 well, she was there at Normandy firing her guns in support of the landings. One of the newest ships there was the destroyer USS Laffey, which, by the way, you can visit in Charleston, South Carolina, at Patriots Point, right next to the USS Yorktown. This ship had just been in commission months, and its first combat experience was off off the shores of, of, of the Cotin Peninsula. Excuse me. <coughs> And of course, did well, uh, provided gunfire support. And her, her day of reckoning came six or seven months later when at the Battle of Okinawa, she was bombed and struck by 10 different times uh, by six kamikaze aircraft, uh, a aerial bombs strafing and survived. And not only survived, went on to serve in the Navy, active Navy fleet until the mid 1970s. So that's quite a span of human history. It certainly is. Um, the idea that a, um, a ship that was at Normandy is still in service in 1975, it, that shows you that continuum of sort of through the ages and through these different periods that we'll separate in our minds. But um, a Navy, it, it, it evolves and you know, they drop out and more are added in as they go, but there's always that through line. And the, the ships that have that kind of history that endures through those decades are a large part of that um, continuous identity of, a, of the Navy and of a fleet. Exactly. And, and the, was, the way that this is such a large fleet encompasses that, uh, the old and the new. And um, there's also, as you point out in your uh, sidebar piece, um, uh, a lot of... Um, representatives of occupied nations, Nazi occupied nations um, have vessels that are taking part in this as well. We should mention them too. Yeah, it was not, it was more than a footnote. Um, the British, the French, or not the British, the Free French, the Poles, uh, even a small delegation of Greeks, Norwegians, um, I think even some Dutchmen, uh, sailors and officers who fled when the Nazis took over their countries, uh, landed in, in the UK and the British helped them organize into their own nationalistic naval components. And my, my previous research is fixated upon the Free French because uh, Admiral or, or General Charles de Gaulle and his, his subordinates actually put together a pretty effective naval force because they had some surviving uh, capital ships from the French Navy, as well as these British escort ships that were essentially turned over to French crews. One of the real heroes of the Battle of the Atlantic from just the year before was the uh, flower class frigate Aconit, manned by a free French crew. She was there at Normandy, essentially in a modified patrol mission, being a very small you know, Corvette escort. But in 1943, she became one of the fewest warships to sink two German U-boats within four hours of each other. Uh, and as they say, it even made the New York Times. Um, <laughs> but but I, I, I think it was like you get the experience in the war to date and you put together this all-star team at Normandy. And it's just a fascinating just cross-section and array of ships and men. So let's talk about how the operation unfolds. Let's start with day one and um, kind of take uh, the audience through the action as blow by blow away as we can in the time we have. 
Well, the original landing was, as everybody who's read about it knows, it was not June 6th, but the day before. Um, and it took two days in advance of that to get everybody away from the pier, underway, uh, troops on board, weapons trained. And they, they, the, this whole mass of ships, convoy after convoy, minesweepers in front clearing the lanes, started to go, and then they called them back because the weather turned bad. And the poor, poor soldiers and sailors returned to these crowded ports and essentially lay at anchor for uh, over 24 hours in torrential rain, getting soaked and chilled in addition to exhausted. So then on the morning of the, of the 5th, Eisenhower finally made the decision to go. They relaunched Neptune. And from a score of British ports, from the, the coast of Essex and around the east, all the way around into the uh, Irish Sea, all these LSTs, landing craft, destroyers, you name it, got underway in, in a very careful sequence because they had to form up south of the Isle of Wight, which is kind of in the middle of the English Channel, into five separate corridors, one each aiming for a separate beach, Utah, Omaha, Sword, Juno, and Gold. And the minesweepers, to me, were the unsung heroes because they went ahead of this mess, clearing out thousands of mines that, that the Germans had laid in the channel itself and in the Bay of the Seine. And in, as they did this, they were they were leaving lighted buoys. I believe it was a mile wide, a 400 yard wide corridor for each of these transit lanes. And they'd lay a lighted buoy once every mile. And so the ships, I guess, traveling very slowly could see this kind of like a runway light at night when you're coming in on an airplane, showing them how to get to their beach. And to my deep, not astonishment, but just amazement, it worked. Um, there were several uh, mining incidents. Uh, the USS Osprey became the first American ship sunk in the operation when she struck a mine south of uh, Isle of Wight, killed six of her crew. But the main force just got on through, and by sunrise the next morning, they were in place to start the bombardment of, of the German positions. Um, and some of our destroyers, uh, many of which were making their, having their baptism under fire in this um, battle, get right up in the thick of it, close to shore at some points. And we should maybe mention that as well, because it's a pretty stirring part of this whole thing. Right. They, they, had, they had set up, uh, as everyone knows, they had set up uh, anchorages for the main bombardment ships, the cruisers and the battleships. And these are about, I think, five miles offshore. But they had... Uh, four or five destroyers at each of the beaches whose job was to come in closer and to provide spot fire as needed. <clears throat> and at Omaha Beach, uh, as, as the history has, has shown, th there was a major Allied intelligence failure, the only one that made a, a real significance in terms of casualties. Uh, they had estimated that only a, a diminished regiment of second-rate German home guard troops would be guarding Omaha Beach. And it turned out to be a battle-hardened division. I think half of it was there, three or two or three regiments. And they were dug in, they had crossfire, they had their, their guns sighted, and they had really built up an amazing, amazingly impossible to get through line of, of uh, you know, mines and, and, and barbed wire and, and, and you know, these devices aimed at sinking uh, landing craft. And so the invasion foundered there. And the, the destroyers, as I remember, the orders were to stay a certain period offshore unless there was an emergency. And at one point they decided, okay, this is the emergency. And they came in so close, they were scraping their keels on the sand. And one of them, the USS Corey, and this is a well-told tell tale, came in close enough and was just trading, uh, you know, like point blank artillery fire with German defending positions. And they brought in a, a bunch of airplanes to lay smoke screens to protect the destroyers. And so the three or four other destroyers are suddenly shrouded in smoke 
and the Germans could not see them. But the airplane that was supposed to protect the quarry got shot down before it could lay the smoke system, smoke field. And so all of a sudden, that was the only ship that the German gunners could see. And so they immediately just started raining shells upon her. Well, the poor captain didn't have anywhere to go because there was a very narrow, cleared lane where the mines had been swept and and, and trying to dodge, you know, this, this rain of, of, of German artillery. He, he blundered out of the lane, struck a mine and, and essentially sank right there in shallow water. His poor crew were overboard clinging to debris in the side of the hull and, and they, they were forced to endure hours more of, of gunfire because the Germans couldn't see anything else to shoot at until the landing started. So that was one pretty uh, horrible experience for the U.S. Navy, but in, in all, the, the destroyers played an amazing role in, in uh, assisting in clearing out the defenders at Omaha Beach. That was some tough fighting at that beach, and like you say, that was... Um not entirely anticipated. Uh, we also had uh, advanced Navy teams had actually gone ashore to um, help sort of, uh, you know, sab do whatever sabotage they could do uh, to help set the stage for it. And they're often forgotten in this as well. Um, well, yeah, there was, yeah, you know, this is something I had not focused on in earlier research. And I was, I was fascinated by, they called them the, um, the, the, barrier defense teams or something, uh, uh, GAT teams, uh, GAP assault teams. And this was a joint effort. They had Navy frogmen along with uh, special army combat engineers who were experts in, in, you know, clearing things by blowing them up. And they came in in teams. Each one was supposed to lay uh, explosives along to clear uh, passage onto the beach throughout all those obstacles. Uh, but unfortunately, the, there was, because of the intense German gunfire, the initial soldiers who landed ahead of these teams, who were supposed to start fighting their way inland, were pinned down and hiding behind the obstacles that the poor assault teams were supposed to blow up. And so that was essentially a classic example of a plan not surviving first contact with the enemy. And by the end of, of the day on D-Day, I think they'd gotten five or six of these lanes cleared. But in the meantime, a lot of soldiers were just, you know, dug in and, and hung up on the barriers where they essentially had a great chance of being shot or drowning as the tide came back in. So it was one of the things where victory was achieved, but it was, it was not very easy and it was very, very expensive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, it was hard to um, crack the nut of those uh, uh, German gun emplacements. Uh, they were so well entrenched. And uh, I'm thinking of it from the, from the point of view of the troops um, hitting those beaches. And uh, it's really hard to put your head into what that must have been like. And I have uh, every time I think about D-Day, I just think about um, the remarkable level of sheer raw courage in that moment. And you probably don't even know what that moon is like until you're in it that was involved with all those troops. And um, and it it must have felt like there's no way we're all going to get through there. But they finally do. I mean, after a great sacrifice, they finally do. What are some other ways that the, um, the, 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 the fleet was helping with the operation on land that we haven't talked about yet? Well, a very basic one is the the swarms of, of, of landing craft that brought the soldiers ashore were there and also helped save a lot of lives by immediately retrieving those who had been wounded and racing them back out to where they could be uh, given medical treatment uh, on, the, on the support vessels and the, the salt ships. Um, this became kind of a conveyor belt in reverse. And it's not something you'd focus on in a classic description of a battle. But for each of the guys that got hit and got rescued and got saved because of it, I'm sure it was a very, very, very big deal. Um, the the gunfire support itself was to the degree that the Pacific f f became a real challenge with the dug-in Japanese on Iwo 
Chima and Okinawa. Uh, from what I understand, the, the gunfire here was quite effective. Uh, the battleships had aerial spotters and, and were able to immediately blast German uh, units that were trying to, you know, get to the beach and, and, and help cut off the, the airborne and the beach uh, soldiers from support. Uh, there's one example of the Nevada, if I remember correctly, I'm not looking at my article, uh, was told of a German tank formation some 19 or 20 miles inland uh, by an aerial spotter, and they they raised their barrels to the right azimuth and, and just blasted it out of, the, out of the terrain. So that's pretty impressive. When you think of battleships, I always think of, you know, kind of shooting a lot of shells in a certain direction, but they were pinpoint accurate. Yeah, that's damn impressive, actually. Um, well, there's a famous quote that you give in there, that, and uh, it's a quote from an Army officer, and it's, thank God for the United States Navy. Uh, let's this talk about that for a second. Yeah, Clarence, uh, General Clarence Hubner was the commander of the first, commanding general of the 1st Infantry Division, and they went ashore at Omaha. So when he finally realized that enough of his soldiers had gotten in at the end of that day with amazingly heavy losses in the first waves, he had eyewitnessed the Corey and the other destroyers putting themselves at hazard to, to help the soldiers on the beach. And it's and he said a wonderful phrase that you don't hear during the Army Navy game. He said, Thank God for the United States Navy. Yes. <laughs> It's especially nice to hear that coming from the army. Absolutely. Um, and, he, 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 and he said it on bed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I mean, that's one day where you're going to think that. Now, after they finally uh, managed to establish that beachhead, it's just, uh, again, another thing that's impressive in the scope and scale of it is just the, the massive landing of uh, men and materiel and, uh, it just it just starts and it just keeps going. This drags on for quite some time, actually, as the um, the massive invasion force is making its way to land. Uh, we should maybe talk about that because we we're focusing on D Day and the anniversary of D Day, but that's really just the beginning of what. Oh, followed. exactly, exactly. Uh, they they put together on you know we, every, everybody saw the, you know the longest day and band of brothers and obviously you're focusing on that key 24 hour period but the battle for normandy went on for months in fact the the landing of troops and and supplies went on throughout the end of the year um, i discovered and this is one of those discoveries as a historian that you go oh uh, i found out why a member of my family died on December 24th on Christmas Eve, 1944. He was an army soldier named Robert uh, Claybrook. And he was one of 815 soldiers on the troop ship Leopoldville, Belgian transport that was bringing them ashore in Cherbourg. And, you know, this is five months later, you think everything's safe. Uh, a U-boat torpedoed that trip ship, and it went down with over 800 uh, sailors and soldiers killed, including my father's first cousin. It was wow. a bit of a shock to discover this. Incidentally, that same night, my father had to bail out of a plane over Virginia when uh, the weather came in so fast and he couldn't find an airport to land at. So that's a rough night for our family. I'll say. And it's Christmas Eve of all. Oh, nice for that. So. Well, that's a, another story away from naval history, but he landed in a tree outside a farmhouse in a parachute, and a little kid came running out and said, hey, Mom, Santa's here. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine that's not a story that gets trotted out every Christmas in the Offley household. That's just priceless. <laughs> Believe me, it does. That's amazing. Well, uh, you point out... Um, the, how uh, a lot of these ships after uh, Operation Neptune are going to end up in uh, Operation Dragoon shortly thereafter, the invasion of southern France, the coast of southern France, which is always overshadowed by the Normandy invasion. Um, but, you know, that that's kind of a significant big deal, too, as they kind of are starting to 
come in and uh, not only liberate France and everything, but push toward inexorably toward Germany from the, these two directions that are going to merge as they head eastward. That's worth mentioning as well. There's not much rest for uh, many of these uh, ships and crews off of Normandy. Well, one of the one of the stories that you know obviously came out from the war, the last year of fighting in, in Europe was that all of the uh, soldiers, and I think back from my uh, reading and, and watching Band of Brothers, they, they finally get to the end of the German campaign and they're very quietly told, okay, we're gonna have a couple of weeks rest and then we're gonna head to the Pacific for the invasion of Japan. You know, the whole army in Europe was under the cloud of possibility of having to trans navigate the globe for what would have been an invasion that made Normandy look like a tea party. Well, fortunately, because of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, that did not occur. But for the Navy, it did. Uh, the number of ships at Neptune that later went to the Pacific for the Iwo Jima and Okinawa landings in, in the Philippines too, uh, it, it was all the battleships, the Nevada, the Arkansas, and the Texas, most of the cruisers uh, and a heck of a lot of the destroyers and, and other escorts, all of the troop ships, they all ended up going through the Panama Canal and uh, taking part in what were two of the even larger and bloodier battles of World War II. So the Navy did a great job at Normandy, but they didn't get the rest of the war off. Yeah, and you know, that just that's another thing that boggles the mind. Like so many things about the Second World War. There's so many layers to that onion, and it's on a so epic a scope that almost the word epic doesn't do it justice. The Pacific War by itself is one of the major wars of history. The World War II in Europe itself is that. To have these things happening simultaneously as part of this overall conflict. Uh, I don't think, um, I'm not sure the population today could un could conceptualize something on that scale or what that would feel like. Um, the true concept of total war where civilians, not only the military are involved in the, what's going on on a daily basis. Um, that's, I'm probably waxing a little too philosophical here, but when you think about the two theaters of this war and how the, you're right. The Navy has to, uh, th these ships are going from one theater, finishing there, barely catching their breath, and they're heading off to another epic undertaking on the far side of the globe. It, it's just, uh, it's beyond impressive. Yeah, it reminds me, this is parallel. I, I profiled in one of my books about the Battle of the Atlantic of a young British uh, merchant seaman who's, who thought about it really hard and long and decided that when the war broke out, instead of joining the British Army or the Royal Marines, he played safe and become a merchant sailor on, on a freighter. And he survived at least one sinking in the war. And to his horror, he found out after World War II was over that by joining the Merchant Navy, he was four times as likely to die than if he joined the Royal Marines. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So... It's not the safer option. The longer at <laughs> sea, you know, it's like a, you're, you're like the little duck in a shooting gallery. You keep going back and forth. And <laughs> it applies to warships that are deploying as well. These guys were there. It was a 365 day pretty much war for these guys. You know, and they talk mm -hmm. about getting a week in, in, in Long Beach or a week in Hawaii before they went off to the Pacific. That's something that even the Cold War Navy would have said, okay, that's nice. But this is the first time they've been on land in months. So I'm sure they appreciated it. Mm -hmm. But you're right. And, and the only thing that keeps me kind of worried these days is that a lot of experts are saying uh, this could be like 1937 or 38 right now in terms of a, a slow coalescing of powerful nations whose interests are hostile to the United States and NATO i.e. Iran, China, Russia, North Korea. And uh, our dear public uh, civilians may yet learn what it's like 
uh, to find themselves in a global emergency. I hope they do not. I hope it does not happen. But the, some of the early indicators are starting to get really creepily familiar. So yes. I hope I'm wrong. I do too. May there never be the need for another Normandy. But um, humans being humans, uh, the future is unwritten and it often repeats what's happened in the past. But let's pray that's not the case. And let's honor those who are there at Normandy um, by remembering them. The way to remembering them is to immerse yourself in that history. Learn those stories. Um, even when you learn the sort of topmost layer of it, there's a million different human stories underneath it. And an anniversary is a good time to remember those things. And um, we appreciate your... Um, contributions to the magazine this June, Ed, that help people honor and remember and commemorate what went on 80 years but, ago in June but, 1944. Um, I urge everybody who has not read Ed's article in the current issue to do so and be sure to go to Naval History Online for more Normandy related content, including Ed's additional piece that lives online as well at our website online. Ed, thanks for joining us. Um, I'm sure we'll have you back again very soon. And um, it's been a pleasure talking to you again, as always. And I look forward to seeing you again in the magazine and here on the podcast as well. I'll take that as marching orders. All right. Well, thank you and take care. Take care. I guess that's it for us for today, folks. Until next time, I bid you fair winds and following seas.